Hi, welcome to the Dot Wave podcast. This is a show where we talk about music production and freelancing without getting too technical and in the weeds. Uh, this is episode three. Today we'll be talking about best practices when it comes to recording and mixing and freelancing as well, anything like that. Um, Andrew, you want to start us off? Um, what Absolutely. is a best practice that you subscribe to with every single project? A best practice? I, I it, That's kind of a tough one to pick from, really. One specific one that I like to stick with. Um, it's kind of editing, man. Getting tight edits throughout the recording, which might not be specifically mixing, although I do receive tracks sometimes that need editing. Uh, that's one thing that I start with that really like ensues the whole project and starts me off on the right foot. That way I don't have to do any weird nitpicking along the way and stopping this process to make sure that this is tight. And then, you know, I used to work section by section, but that's slowly kind of faded. I, I do editing all in one chunk, which I feel like is a good practice to get through. You know, it takes a lot of, uh, uh, what would the word be? It, it's a little tedious. It's very uh, daunting and tedious, but it's a good thing to get used to so you can get it all done at once. Editing is, uh, that's a, that's a great one to bring up. I mean, um, Take, for example, when you're tracking a vocalist, it's very, very important to edit out the breaths while you're there because otherwise you'll yes. just be doing it later all in one go rather than taking yeah. three three seconds after each take just to get it all pretty. Now you're taking, you know, sometimes five, ten minutes to get the whole track nice all in one go and it, it can easily burn you out. So definitely oh, yeah. agree um, when I'm tracking guitars. I definitely like to make sure things are lined up. If, you know, take is good but one chug is a little off, I like to nudge that chug over make sure everything is all tip top um drums are the only thing that i don't edit as we're doing them because it's so time consuming understandable there yeah um one thing i do do with drums though is i like to comp takes while the drummer is still around so we'll have him play the song three or four times and then out of those takes we'll pick the best parts of each right i'll sit mm -hmm. them down and usually it takes longer to pick the best takes and stitch together than it does to actually track the song if he's good really but that's I feel, amazing. I feel that by doing that, um, it saves you from having that awkward moment when the drummer packs up and leaves, and then you realize, oh shit, the fill he did here doesn't really edit nicely with this next part that we have. Mm -hmm. Like, oh, he needs to hit this symbol, or it doesn't ring properly. And yeah. that can make the whole recording suffer. And you know, there's yeah. no way to get If he comes the... back, it's never going to be set up the same. Exactly. There's no way to get that thing to sound the same. So it's definitely better to get things like that done on the spot while you still can. More time consuming, but the production turns out a lot better for it. It does. That That's the same sacrifice I told myself is right now, if I spend two hours or whatever it is editing this track all the way through, then I can enjoy the mix process later without having to be like, oh, like I got to go back and like redo this. Like I got to edit this important. part before I do it. You know, kind of getting the heavy load out of the way first, I feel like is is generally a good practice, you know, because it pays off in the end. Your workload is going to get a little lighter as you move. Anytime you have to edit when you're mixing immediately kills your workflow. Absolutely. I mean, mix, it mixing does. should be creative and fun and it should happen fairly quickly, you know? Mm -hmm. and, and, and whenever you do that, whenever you take a second to, to fuck with a vocal, you're, you're taking yourself out of the mixing mode and it's very hard to get back into that workflow. Yeah. Um, another thing is like vocal editing, like tuning. Tuning with Melodyne. Oh, yeah, yeah. That's so Absolutely. time consuming and annoying. If you have to do that, you know, as you're mixing, that oh, project's going to turn about out it. like shit. Yeah, 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 absolutely. That's just such a bummer, dude. And, and it's great you bring it up as you're recording, too, because I try and do the same thing with clients that are in. Record, like, everything that I can. You know, not all of it, because I don't want to be a total buzzkill, because that can turn them off, I feel like, if you're there for 20, 30 minutes editing their guitar recording or whatever the case might be. Or you just but like, be fast. Yeah, like little things here, there. Yeah, get a good workflow with it. I, I definitely like to do it in one chunk if I can, but to get them like a good idea on how it maybe a an unsure performance might be, you know, then they're, they're usually yeah. if I edit it right there, they're like, oh, okay, that like that sounds fine. Like that's great. Well, have you ever noticed how clients will oftentimes play something and be like, nah, I fucked up. I got to do it again. They think they're like, take sucks. And then you're like, no, dude, it's literally like it's perfect other than this one thing. Watch this. And you fix yep. it. And they're like, Oh shit! It actually sounds great. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> dude, not only all do the you time. save time, but you like it keeps the the vibe going, keeps their mood up, so they don't have to keep banging on apart over and over again. Totally, dude. That can be yeah. equally as much of a buzzkill. Oh, huge buzzkill. Yeah. Well, all right. So next thing, um, I think that I personally think is very important 
in maintaining kind of that quick workflow um, is templates, mixing mm. templates, tracking templates. You know, you can pull up something and all of a sudden your drums are already, all the inputs are mapped exactly how you like it. Yes. You know, you pull a up a guitar set. chain and band comes in, they want a metal sound. You pull up a chain. It's pretty much all the way there. You might tweak a knob or two, but it takes like under a minute to get the guitar tone that they want rather than, you know, multiple minutes of like, well, maybe we can try this plugin. Maybe we can try this. Just, just yeah. takes, takes all the unnecessary downtime. Um, yeah. And just gets rid of it. I mean, it allows yeah. you to just get to the, the meat of tracking. Away. Yeah. Yep. It's I amazing, mean, dude. When when I work with a band enough, sometimes I'll even start using mix templates, which yeah. is not something I would always do. But you know, if you nail a mix for a client and they love it, the next time they come back, why not just fucking slap that shit on there for the guitar and bass sound? Like you're gonna of end course. up tweaking it. You're gonna end up tweaking it more, cause, especially if you're using live drums, because you'll never get the drums to sound exactly like that. But you can send the client home with something that's like seventy percent of the way there, just if you have a good template. And you yeah. worked with them before, and that's that's great for them. I mean, and it also makes the mix process even faster for you. It's it's less, you know, it's less guessing, and it's more just like, all right, let's identify the problems right now, and let's just fix those. And then the mix is pretty much there. Yep, yep. It's important to not take that template too far out of play, though. I, I have a bunch of templates saved and signal chains saved, you know, because I, I was just kind of lazy at the time. I'd set up like an EQ, a seventy six, a two A. And then like a limiter or whatever the whatever the chain would be. Sure. Um, and I'm like, I like I'll have it dialed to someone's specific thing, and then I'll throw it on something else. And it, it was like a turn off. Like I heard how everything was reacting with one another on a totally different vocal. Uh, I re really the totally different genre. If I was going from a metal production to a rap production, and and you know those tools they're pr pretty across the board. The fundamentals of your production tools are across the board. You're not gonna not use a 76 because it's a rap song. I just didn't like it, you know, and I'll end up deleting everything and then starting from scratch instead of sifting through these templates and presets that I saved for myself. So like you said, you know, if you're familiar with the project and you have something that works and recording was relatively the same, dynamics are seemingly same, why not use it? You know, don't mess with yeah. it if it's already working. Well, I think you're right in that templates should be genre specific because you're you're hitting the nail on the head. What works for a metal track probably won't work for a rap track. I mean... I think about metal when it comes to even something like an 1176 or just compression in general. And on the vocal, you're probably thinking a higher ratio, right? Yes. And on a rap vocal, it probably doesn't need to be fucking squashed. The dynamics aren't going to be as crazy as, you know, somebody screaming into a microphone. It's totally true. Yeah. Yeah. And you're probably not going to need as much saturation on somebody who's just rapping rather than, you know, <laughs> screaming. Because screaming is yeah. so harsh and gross. You need to add things like distortion to make it sit a little nicer. Yeah, yeah, and it's it's fun in that nature, too. I feel like with a lot of metal vocals, uh, you get very experimental, which is mm. uh, kind of another reason. I don't use a whole lot of preset, like saved presets so much. Definitely templates, that's for sure, because I have sure. people who I've worked with for like 20 or 30 songs, mm -hmm. and the template's just amazing. It's so be it the recording situation is the same, you know, but even then, it's pretty easy to switch plugins in and out or mess with this threshold here, remove some of this EQ boost here. Um you know, to just keep uh, experimenting with your plugins definitely makes it fun. Add some little spizzazz to your workflow. I actually am a little bit of the opposite. I will use presets, especially when it comes to things like uh, amp sims, presets that I've made. Mainly oh, there we in, go. Absolutely. Mainly in the uh, cab section, because let's take uh, the neural DSP um, plugins mm -hmm. that we've both been using recently that I think everybody's been using. They're fucking great. They're beautiful. You, sh you should be using them. <laughs> They're, they're a great Absolutely. tool to have. Uh, like if you don't have an amazing room and amazing mics, that'll get you a great guitar sound that sounds pretty much like the real thing. It's nailing it. Um, but I, I've noticed that the cab section on there reacts very similarly to how a cab with those microphones in real life would work. So, you know, my go-to setup on guitars is a Royer 121 and either an SM57 or an I5. Um Preferably, preferably, gee, I can't talk. Preferably the i5, <laughs> but um, Neural DSP has an SM57 and a Royer 121 sim. And as I move them around and place them roughly where I like to place them on the amp, I'm noticing this cab sim is reacting exactly how I would expect it to. So once I nail, dial that in and get that impulse response, great. I just save that and I use that for most of my guitar tones because 
I don't know. You, you can mess with the amp head a lot and get wildly different sounds, but I feel like the, the cab matters even more. And if you know that if you've got your cab dialed into a good place, then it makes it even easier to get a good tone quickly. When you're switching amps like that, I don't know if you mind explaining a little bit what the dynamic between the amp and the cab are doing. Um, you know, like you said, you can switch up things on your amp head and get like wildly different tones, you know, but I, I find myself when I do that messing with the cab as well to get something that sits better, you know, and there's no like fundamental rule or anything like that that you should follow. But is there there's like a specific dynamic or reasoning why you keep the cab? There's some with cabs that you should follow. Just just like there's no right way to do it, but you should know, you know, I want a darker sound. It's like, all right, move it away from the center of the cone. Mm. Want a brighter sound, put it dead fucking center, right? Put it closer, you know? Yeah. You want a sound with more room back off a little bit. There 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 are definitely, you know, best practices when it comes to mic placement. Um yeah. yeah. Uh when it when it on guitar amps. Um I guess the reason why I like to get the cab cooking the way that I want it to and and set it there is because when I would work with real cabs uh, in the past, you know, quite a lot more, and I had access to things like Royer 121s and nicer mics, mm. um, I tended to go with a similar setup each time. One, out of convenience, but two, because I experimented to get that setup, and I noticed that it sounded really fucking good. Something about okay. it. You know, I put these mics in this certain, you know, put them, this combination of mics in, in this position, you know, this distance off the speaker, and I noticed that I would get, you know, the low mids sitting where I wanted them most of the time, or, you know, it wouldn't I got be too you. overbearing and a lot. Just, I guess the overall balance was, was just more recognizable to my ear, you know, or, or that's it got, really cool. It, or it got the tone closer to where I wanted without even having to adjust the amp. Um, and was that like a universal? If you brought in say one amp and brought in another amp, you would keep that same setup between those two mics placement um, and all. Yes, because usually we were using the same cab, so it's the same kind of principle with the neural DSP. That's really cool. We would have okay. the head, we would have the head in the control room, and then it would go out to the same cab that we'd always use that had you know V30s or something in there. Yeah, it sounded really nice. Um, that's yeah. awesome. So since the cab yeah, was the cool. constant, since the cab was the constant, I guess the idea was that I only had the amp as as an X factor. So I didn't have yes. too many moving variables that would give me a headache and change things to where it would be like harder to work with and less uh recognizable i guess you could say in terms of uh sound quality it's it's kind of yeah. hard to describe but I, I hope you're kind of getting the idea of, of why i think it's important to get an impulse response of Just course either an impulse response or a cab set up in a way that's pleasing to you um yeah it, it tended to work for pretty much every style of guitar that that i recorded sometimes i'd use that's really more cool. of the ribbon and less of the 57 depending on the style of guitar but sure. That combo in that position tended to work really well. Um, you know, and having those constants too, that makes you a, a little more efficient too. Yes. You, you pinpoint these variables that could change and you mitigate those. And before you know it, you're moving like twice as fast. Absolutely. I mean, Something I think like we, that I've never focused on though, specifically an amp cab. Not so much. You know, I do, but I, I've never like saved an amp cab setup because I'm like, wow, that's that's really good. I just find myself messing with all of these variables every single time. I think I think you should start saving it. If you notice you're doing the I'm same going to. If you if you notice you're doing the same thing often, you know, that yeah, that's when it's right. that's when it's time to start saving that uh that preset on on that cab. Absolutely um, right. Yeah. And 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 this leads us into our next topic and how I arrived at, you know, me liking a Royer and a 57 in these certain positions was I experimented a lot. I tried different mic positions a fucking lot and I did that on drums as well, you know. I, mm -hmm. I I have a somewhat limited set of microphones, but I have enough to record a full kit, do a couple pair of rooms, but I know exactly which of those mics I like on which drums because I've messed around and I've tried different combos. Um, I, I, I think experimentation, you know, is not only applicable to microphones, though. I think it's also very, very applicable to plugins. Um, of course, man. In, in many, every realm of production, totally. How many times have you recently, let's say in this last project that you've done, mm -hmm. did you do something surprising with your plugins that you've never done before? And you're like, huh, that kind of that kind of works. I like that. Yeah, you know, I, I find a lot of tips online in forums and I follow a ton of producers on TikTok. And uh, they're always talking about this, that, or the other. And one of the things that I saw was using... Uh, FabFilter Pro L2, I think it was, uh, their limiter, as a clipper. 
And I don't remember mm. the exact parameters I changed, but instead of using JST clip on my snare and kick, I tried that and it was a lot cleaner, I guess. Transparent yeah. would be a good word for it, but it, has it, it sounded cool. It would not have been like something that I would have done and, and been surprised about before. You know, it's the last thing you would expect kind of thing. It's yeah, a it limiter. Has, it has oversampling on it. So it makes it sense that the, you know, when, when you clip it where you're adding kind of like a type of distortion, it's going to, it's going to sound yeah. a little better than the JST stuff. Yeah. JST even things like uh gain reduction too, you know, you could use that mm. on drums. It's, it does something interesting. It's kind of cool. It's been a while, but I, I think I did use that on a room mic a long time ago. It I, works, I remember it man. being kind of interesting. Yeah, it squashes the fucking piss out of stuff. I, if you want, <laughs> if you want something that'll make something sound fucking aggressive and mean, that'll definitely do it. I, that's my go-to vocal compressor, and and honestly, every it's genre amazing. at this point, because I slap it on there, and I, you know, I have a go-to preset for just my SM7B because I've used it a lot. Mm -hmm. I slap it on there, I put the preset on there, and it's like ninety percent of the way there. Oh like the yeah, and it's so user done. friendly too. Yeah, yeah. It's absolutely great plugin. JST gain reduction. Buy that shit. Anybody listening? Yep. That is a fucking time saver, especially for metal and rock. But I've used it on rap. It is a great yeah. fucking great compressor. It absolutely. really is, man. I think it's actually no. modeling an entire chain. I think it's modeling like, you know, two types of compression probably, like FET and optical, and then it's feeding into a limiter and it's saturating. Like it's doing a lot. It's, it's doing yeah, there's a, a lot, lot happening shit. there. Yeah. It's a powerful tool. Absolutely. This and is now the fun of it, you know. This is now an tools. ad for JST. <laughs> I know, no kidding, huh? <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's uh, but but yeah, plugins like that. We're kind of going a little off topic, but plugins like that, fuck it, because this is an important thing to talk about is plugins that save you time are the most useful things. It is wor it is worth their weight in gold. Whatever yes. you spend on them, it's so fucking worth it. Like um, let me think of plugins. One that I have is from Melda, and it's called Auto Align. And if I have 16 drum tracks, I click one button and it phase aligns all of them. So there's no issues. Oh, that's awesome. Like, fucking amazing, you know? <laughs> so cool. It just saves me from having to manually listen and go through. Like, fuck that shit. Slap it on yep. there. It does the job. Sometimes it'll get, like, one mic wrong. I'm like, all right, correct that. Boom. Done. Totally. You know? God, there, there's so many plugins I have that save me time. I have a... A plugin that I don't use all the time, but occasionally I do, is a uh, rich mastering or rich drums. Like you can pretty oh, quickly I've never heard mix. Of that. Yeah, good, good, nifty little plugins. Excellent. Or ozone. You know, ozone's another time. Ozone. Saver. I've heard so much good about great. ozone. Like oh, heaps it's great. and heaps of good. It's great. It's spe a lot of those newer AI plugins as well, like Smart EQ or even Isotopes Neutron. Like people might scoff and look down on AI tools, but they're really good at balancing things and they're really good at creating separation between things. And then they let you just focus on like creative decisions. Exactly, know? man. You want to like, take those technical workloads out of your, your yeah. process. It's not, you don't really want to take them away, but you want to finish them up quickly. You want to resolve those problems so you can move on to the creative fun part. And yes, you know, I, I feel like more importantly, efficiency too. You want to have good turnover rates and be, be effective really more than yeah. efficiency. I feel like is be effective. That's, that's the key. Yeah, I, I, anything that makes you work faster, I think is worth it. Honestly, absolutely, it, always worth it. Um, that's not to say you know get these plugins and call it a day. I, I'm all for like grabbing some individuals and still experimenting because I feel like that's where you sure. learn the sure. most is through experimenting. And you know, it, it, I would be a totally different engineer. I feel like if say I did start with some AI tools and, yeah. and didn't have any a slate mix rack say or fab filter, I, I feel like it'd be a lot different. I, yeah. I feel like my approaches wouldn't be as creative and fun because that mm. experimentation is you being creative. It's you finding I, the touch that this needs maybe with a, a freaking vocal plug-in on a drum bus or something. I think I think part of experimentation that's important is you have to really know your tools, right? So mm. I, I like, we it's just true. talked about this before the podcast, I, I like to... Whenever I get a new plugin that's modeled after an analog piece of gear, I like to read about it. I'm like, okay, what type of compressor is it? Because from that, I can infer what it'll be good at. You know, VCA, snappy, cool. It'll be great on drums. Um, you know, FET, ooh, that's really cool. It has very short attack and release times. Like, it'll be cool yeah. on like a vocal or a bass um, or drums, right? Um, but I like to learn, you know, specifics about the gear. But then I also like to look up, you know, what do people usually do with it? What are some common go-to things people do with it? Because chances are go. other engineers, you know, have taken years and years experimenting and figuring this shit out. And there's probably totally. a reason why they do things a certain way. Oh, and, of course. Um, 
from then you can experiment, but that, that gets you like started really quickly. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I, I think it's important to learn from the best practices of the engineers that have come from before us because this is an iterative uh, art form or craft or whatever you want to call this. It's kind of in between art and, and a craft, right? Yeah. Um, but it's definitely iterative. We're building off of the generations that come before us. And, totally. Um, That's still... kind of the beauty of it too, I feel like, man. As it grows, you know, the, the production style, I feel like, gets more and more qualitable with all of these people doing the same thing, really. What experimenting and qualitable. developing these tools that get you to that point quicker. Qualitable. Don't make up fucking words on the podcast, Andrew. Huh? Don't make up words on the podcast. What? <laughs> you said qualitable. It's oh, whatever. Easier. I've been saying that for ages. <laughs> Have I been saying that wrong my whole life? Qualitable? Yes. Well, that's a word. I, I think so. I don't think that's a word, but we'll look that up. It, okay, I'm going to look it up right now. Let's check. Look it up. Look it up. I've been saying that, I swear, not just for today. I know last time I was being real fancy. Qualitable Years. is not a word. Whatever. You're lying. <laughs> You're lying. I ain't lying, man. I just looked that shit up. Whatever. Okay. Well, that, that was a good qualitable result there. <laughs> <laughs> so... um. <laughs> Getting back to um, knowing your tools, like, yeah, research yeah. that shit. Look at the history of something. I think that's important. And from there, you can make educated guesses about what it'll be good at. Um, you know, Fairchilds, for example, are really good at just like squashing shit, just making shit real flat. So it's good on vocals. But, you know, you might find, hey, if it can squash a vocal, maybe you can squash a bass. That'd be yes. kind of cool, right? Or you totally. know, whatever. Fucking use it on a master. I don't give a shit. Try it. Yeah, see what happens from it. <laughs> yeah. Fuck around and find out, right? Yep, yep. <laughs> Another good yeah, one, man. dude, is a uh, fail fast too, man. Get 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 all those things that don't work out of the way, so you know. Yeah, oh, you know, that's, with that's being a good experimentational, the experiment with experimenting. Oh my gosh, um, <laughs> could come like huge wastes of time too. You know, you could mm. try all the same plugin on everything and realize, man, I just don't like this plugin. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> if you get that's hints right. of like this working here, this not working here, you know, kind of remember that. That that could also go back to saving presets if you uh find something that's absolutely amazing, save it as a preset. Yeah. Or you can pull it up, like punchy kick, Kramer pie, or whatever. Another fun thing you could do is, which I don't do as much as I should, but sometimes you can just scroll through the presets on a compressor or something. Hmm. And sometimes you'll be so surprised that a preset that is not even marked as something to be used with a particular instrument sounds fucking amazing. Like if it's that's marked awesome. as like an overhead thing or something, and then you put it on bass and you're like, ooh, wait, hold on. Like occasionally you'll just stumble onto little, little things like that. And you're like, Oh shit. You know, <laughs> like this That's works good. amazing. I'm going to yeah, use this yeah, from yeah. now on. I think, um, experimenting is good. I think you shouldn't do it too much on the customer's dime. So if you are in a situation yeah. where you're getting paid hourly to mix, probably not smart to experiment too much. You should go with your pride and true. Mm -hmm. Um, or in my case, you know, I do flat rates for mixes. Um, I can experiment a little bit, but I also want to make sure I'm getting paid a good hourly rate still at the end of the yeah, day. Yeah, so it goes I, both I, ways. Yeah, totally. I try to I try to keep it keep it moving. Like I know that I use SSLs on most things, at least when it comes to analog EQs when I'm adding color. So I'm just probably hmm. going to use that on most things because I know what an 8K shelf on SSL sounds like. Adds air. It's great. It's yep. wonderful. It's just and it keeps excellent. things moving along. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think a good way to experiment though is something that we don't have written down here but we've talked about it before is using reference tracks and mm, absolutely trying to like deconstruct one of your favorite mixes it's yeah. so good you, you'll find yourself using pools that you you have in completely different ways like mm -hmm. i um i was referencing wormwood by the acacia strain which is a will putney mix excellent mix i was referencing that for a mad project. Man. yeah you're fucking kidding i was referencing that for a recent project i did for the band nemesis um, uh, it was an EP, really fucking heavy, and I was trying to get my overheads to sound like his, and I noticed that his overheads were doing this cool thing where they almost like the initial like transient of the hit would go like sh like jump out, and then it would come hmm. back. So like the sustain, the sustain of the symbols was like back here, but the the like hit of the symbols was forward. I was like, oh, wow. that's really cool. And I tried a couple of things, and the thing I ended up doing was I ended up putting a transient designer on, upping the attack and lowering the sustain, and it gave it kind of that pumpier feel that I thought was yeah. really cool. So that's something I've never done before. I just kind of thought, like, what tool do I have that could possibly do this? Yeah, and it I, gets I you thinking. 
Yeah, yeah. So so trying to imitate sounds from your favorite productions is yeah, a, you know, is an excellent not only do you learn, learn from that, but it's so much fun, dude. When I mm. when I heard Nothing Is Beautiful, I think it was the album by Spite. There were so many little like bits and jewels and pieces that I kept hearing, thinking like, how did they do that? And now I do things I was always told, or, or not always told, but it would be said this way. But then I would go and try it this way because I thought there's no way they got that kick drum to sound like that by just doing one compressor. Or, Oh, no way. Not yeah. saturating it or not preamping it. Like, Always no way. Saturated. So now I start doing these things that are like, if you look, asked me like two years ago, I'd cringe at it and be like, that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard, but it works. Hey, now that I works, actually it works. try it, it works. There are no rules. No yep. fucking rules. You know, yep. this is this is art. And if there are the some, the they're meant to be broken. Absolutely. I, I think it's important to know what those rules are first, though, and understand why they're, they're oh, yeah. the best practices, right? But after you understand your gear... You could really do anything. If it sounds good, who fucking cares how you did yeah, it? Yeah. Honestly. Does, yeah. There's uh, so many small tips and tricks that are just out there all over the place. And they're out there for a reason because they probably worked for that guy. Mm -hmm. So it, whether you think it's going to go with your workflow or not, that's your discretion. But it doesn't ever hurt to try because sometimes those things are amazing. Sometimes it'll lead you into doing something and you know, add in a different plugin after that, that really yeah. puts the icing on the cake. You know, there's, there's so many ways that you could experiment and enjoy it too, and come out to a good result. You know, there's not one way to produce a song. One time I was uh, giving an audio lesson a couple years ago to a guy mm -hmm. who was like 16 or 17. And he did something that I never would have thought of, but it worked really well. I think it was on guitars or something. He ended up putting two different instances of uh, Slate's virtual console. Or maybe it was mm. preamp or something. It was like the New York and then like the London. He put them back to back. And I was like, huh, I never would have thought of that. It's not really what people would do. And I turned them off and turned them on. I'm like, that's fucking great. <laughs> oh, yeah. Absolutely. Shit. I can see that, dude. <laughs> like, damn, I didn't think of that. Yeah. Um, don't be afraid to break the rules. It's cool. No. No. Um, and push it to its max, too. Yeah. That's one way Ooh, I feel yeah. like I really got familiar with certain things and certain plugins is I would max them out and then draw it back. Yeah. Yeah. That that like just helped me understand like where is this going to go kind of thing. Cuz if I only do a little bit of something and I've never used it, especially more so back in the day when I was still kind of developing an ear for these plugins, I wouldn't know what to be listening for exactly. So if I cranked it, I knew at that point like okay, that's bad, but that's what I'm I'm adding. That's kind of like a hint of what this is going to do. I always you find that, that repetitious workflow through that too. You know, you can develop a way of doing things with tools that you use like that, that you've gotten familiar with. The same way that you're encouraged to sweep with EQs to find frequencies. I, I think mm. exactly like you said, it's smart to go to extremes with any plugin that you're using just to hear what, what it's doing. Uh, and the way that I've, I've always heard to do it was, you know, you go way too much just to hear what's happening and then you pull it back until... It's like just barely audible. And that's usually the sweet spot with, with yeah. most plugins. Unless you're going for an effect, right? Unless you want it to be like upfront and noticeable that you're doing something. Totally. But uh, if you're mixing generally, we're not trying to we're not trying to go for effects we're, generally, right? We're we're trying to yeah. get things to just like little subtle changes to make things sit better usually. Balance. Um, yeah, totally. balance, balance, control. balance. Control. Yeah, control. Oh, that's everything. <laughs> The more control you take over a track, the better it's going to be. I mean, the more clip gain automation you do, the more mm -hmm. you know master volume automation, the more just just automation in general. The more in depth you go amazing. with that, it is amazing. It is scary, but it, it is what separates the boys from the men. You know, if you want to use that phrase when it comes to yeah. audio, because I think most people can get a pretty good sounding balance, or at least most people are decent at this. But the automation is really that's. That's where it gets like to be even more of an art form. I, I agreed. Think. Yeah, I, I feel like it just displays your uh, attention to detail too. In a yes. way, yes, I definitely had never been that detailed until I really started. Of course, I would hear things, but until I started automating, I didn't realize like doing this one little boost at the first kick of a breakdown is amazing, or adding like a couple of dB a bass, or yeah. I mean, I've tried all kinds of things, and it's it's cool. You know, I feel like it just kind of like draws your ears to the production more, makes you more yeah. creative forces you to be more creative almost because you're going to run out of ways to automate or, or, or maybe you're going to break some more rules again moving forward but you'll be automating different plugins and trying new things to to get things to sound a certain way by part of song or like you said on your master it, you know large and small it's fun creative. that's a 
that's a great automation trick, by the way, where you take either the first syllable of a, a, the vocalist or the first mm -hmm. kick, and you just turn it up. Like, yeah, yeah. That's, that's that's so good. That's so that's great. Good. I mean, and and do it. I I like to do it. Um, clip gain, so it's hitting the chain harder rather than just like overall volume. But, um, it's great. It's a great it, little it trick. Just adds just adds depth to the track. Adds movement. Yeah, um, yeah, add some know, breath, you, man. If you really care live. about your productions, it's smart to do little things like that because, uh, you know, people might not hear that you did that, but it makes it more exciting. Like their brain will will know that you did something. Yes, cool there. it was. Yeah. It's it's a very subconscious thing. I feel like I don't know who I was talking to the other day about this, but those small moves are there. They do make a huge difference at the end. It it gives it that movement. Yeah, there, there's a line. You know, you're using clippers or compressors. You're limiting your master a little bit. And of course, you're trying to retain some dynamics as you go. You don't want to squash everything, but you are kind of controlling. So then it, it almost gives you that opportunity, if you want to use it like that, to do those things. And I feel like you should find different ways to automate that. It adds energy. Makes I heard it a little a, more interesting. Maybe not noticeably, but it's there. There was I we, we talked about this and I mentioned this to you, but I heard an interesting take on automation uh, when I was watching a Nolly master class recently. Where, mm. And he said that, he doesn't automate when he automates he doesn't do it to make parts feel different he does it to keep the vibe the vibe similar like to keep the vibe going in a track Interesting. Uh, in, his, in his words it's like i can have the drums really huge during a chorus basically but if they stay huge during the verse it actually like kills the vibe like it feels feels off that's so, right i remember so the he'll, conversation he'll do things now. like lower room mics during during the verse to keep that consistent sort of vibe now that everything else is less big as well totally um that's so an a interesting good way to think right about there. it yeah, I'm excited to to try automating with just thinking like that. I think it'll be really cool. Yeah, um, you know, and sometimes that's it too. You just get like little bits of uh, theology from people or, or whatever. Yeah, what would the word be? Theology, or something like that. Yeah, maybe philosophy you, you get would those be better. Bits, but, but philosophy, yeah. there it is. Yeah, uh, and, and that's really what can change your mindset rather than hearing like, well, you should just do this, that, and the other, and you try it. It might not have the same. You won't go at it with the same mindset, the same approach. Mm -hmm. It'll be a different set of ears listening. Different, yeah, exactly. Perspective is everything in audio. Mm -hmm. um, speaking of perspective, um, the way that I like to mix, and I think a lot of us are similar. I, I think it's important to give yourself a fair amount of breaks. That's another good practice. You know, don't don't sit down and mix for four hours straight because by the end your ears are fucking fried, man, and you can feel yeah. it. Once you start oh, noticing yeah. the feeling of your ears getting tired, once you once it happens to you enough, you'll know that within thirty to forty minutes. You should probably get up and spend five to ten minutes away from the computer, and you'll actually totally. be more productive if you take those little breaks because you'll you'll get a fresh perspective when you sit down again. Your ears will be somewhat refreshed. Um, That's an mix, amazing feeling. Yeah, what I mean, when I mix, I I like to put in you know do most of the work in one day. I'll usually leave a track alone for a couple of days after that. I just don't mm -hmm. want to even think about it. I want to sit back down and immediately go like, that needs to get fixed. Let's fix that. Let's fix that. Now it's yeah. done. Because it's yeah. instantaneous like that. When you come yeah. back, even after a couple of hours, you're like, oh, boy, I, I, I can hear everything that needs work again. It, it's so much cleaner that way, clearer. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, okay. Well, I, I think um, now that we've gotten fairly nitty gritty, actually, with, with the audio, I think that's the most in-depth we've gotten so far when it comes to actual production techniques. Yeah, I think um, so, which, man. Which is fun. That's it's a whole exciting. world right there. It's exciting for us. Hopefully, we're not just turning off the the viewer, and it's it's I not know. too <laughs> not too deep. But I, I feel like we didn't go. Ah, fuck. We talked about individual compressors. Like ah, shit. Um, true. True. Whatever. Fuck it. I had fun. Enjoy it. Hopefully, someone takes it with them. Have something fun with else, this stuff. Something else that's really really important, just as a best practice, is making sure your tracks sound as as good as they possibly can on the way in, and and part oh, of yeah. that. Part of that has to do, you know, with gear and outboard and preamps and stuff, but a lot of it has to do with new strings on your guitar or new heads or new cymbals on your drums. Just, just, just simple quality of life, you know, or R and R for whatever the fuck you want to call it for for yeah. your instrument. Um, super important, yeah. Or, of course, you know, man. Maybe it's something as simple as like taping the the strings behind the nut, right? Just so they don't yep. vibrate in between chugs. Just, just simple, simple things you can do. That are yeah. gonna make your production just that much better, and that that adds up. It really does, man. New strings. I got some foam in the springs of my Floyd Rose in the back. I've got some foam above the nut, mm -hmm. and it 
it sounds great. <laughs> There's yeah. no weird extra ringing. Yeah, uh, I, I'm not working a gate too hard. I'm not having to like cut stuff out that makes it seem like an unnatural tail at the end of guitar chugs or the gents. Uh, it, not to mention too, having these things make your your jamming life a lot easier and a lot funner. Because yeah. then you you you're getting rid of these harsh qualities of your instrument. Well, not only that, it's like get your fucking guitar set up. Take it to a luthier. Take it to yeah. somebody who knows what he's doing because. If you do that, holy shit, feels like a brand new instrument. It's oh my not, gosh. It's not yeah. fighting you anymore when you're playing it, you know? Yeah, that's important, being comfortable on your instrument, too. You want to be comfortable. You don't want to play some ragged, riggedy piece of, you know, whatever, guitar, bass, drums. You want to have something that you're excited about, that you're comfortable at and can work with. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I, I think that leads us to another good point in that um, having a comfortable and... I think we might have even talked about this last time, but having a convenient setup is super important. Mm. Like, if I have my pedal board out, I'm more likely to use my pedal board. If yeah. my pedal board is tucked away, the chance of me using that dramatically goes down. If I have to plug something in, goes down. You know, like I have my MIDI keyboard already plugged in. All I have to do is move it a little closer. You know, mm -hmm. that that that's all. I like to have a little bit of space over here, but, but that's it. I reach over here, it's there. It's already plugged in. Um, yeah. You it's know, like back I wish... to editing too. You know, if you have all these small things you got to do while you're trying to be creative, mm -hmm. it's just going to shoot you right down. Yeah. Or, or how about this? I um, I have a remote for my monitors. I I click I click a button and my monitors turn on. I don't have to reach back behind them. Oh, that's S cool. Simple things like that. <laughs> that's pretty sweet. Yeah. I mean, do you know it how many times I? Do you know how many times I reached be behind my monitors when I was younger and I'd I'd push them too hard and I moved my monitor. It's like fuck. Oh, dude, <laughs> all the time. <laughs> So all like, the time. It's just super, super easy. You buy a little like remote controlled uh, outlet off of Amazon. It's great. Yep. Absolutely worth it. Um, totally. At the flick of a switch, dude, you're up and mm -hmm. running. That's how I feel about my rack, man. I I, I flip two power, uh, power conditioner switches and everything's on. Yeah. Granted, it's not all linked together, but when I do want to have something in, I have a cable coming from one that can run to the mm -hmm. other. I just got to bypass one unit. Yeah. Easy I, um, peasy. I have one one power button and then I turn on my computer and everything's everything's ready to go. That's amazing. Um, yeah, just uh, that's it's important. Well, also it's a best practice to have your computer and everything running off of one power conditioner because yes. it, it minimizes the chance of just getting weird hums and weird shit in your signals. Yeah, uh, you're you're already going to get a lot of weird shit in your guitar pickups because we're sitting near a computer and we're around so many electronics, and. um God, we're just rolling today. We're just shit we don't even have on paper. But <laughs> hey, another best practice. Fucking get programs like RX to help fix stuff There we like go. That. Yeah, because you, that sounds like a lifesaver of a tool right there. There's RX uh, guitar denoise that can completely mm. get rid of um, just weird computer noises in your guitar, and your single coils especially. Dude, I have that's a jazz, so dope. I have a jazz master. That shit is sensitive, especially if yeah. I switch to my, you know, bridge or my neck pickup because the middle pickup uh, they cancel they're they're wired uh inversely out of phase okay but, um still even then it's got a little bit of noise in there because of the computer and and that rx plugin completely fixes it um rx saved our podcast last week where That's i didn't so realize sick. but i had you know i didn't have the uh, clock source set to ADA, and we were just getting random fucking like like clicks and rx fixed it i just put it on Dude. there and it was gone just oh, amazing. that's cool. Yeah, that's the future right there. I, I swear, dude. I think I said the same thing before. Like some of these plugins are are the future. They're they're there. Absolutely. It's so cool. There. I. What about RX Clip? Have you ever gotten vocals from a client that were just horribly clipped? Mm, yes. You put, you put that shit on there. They don't sound like they're clipping. It's it's. <laughs> How does it, that it, even work? That's I have wild. no. It's fucking black magic. That's it's the amazing. coolest shit. It's amazing, and everybody should have those tools. Because mm. they are going to save your ass. They're going to keep I'm you from sure. having to record in an hour-long podcast again, like we would have had to do yeah. if I didn't have RX, right? It completely saved us. So, so dope, dude. That, the technology behind mm. that is just, like, I can't even fathom that. I yeah. can't even fathom coding, like, a MySpace page, let alone that. You know, that's wild. They have things like um, D-Verb, where if you get a vocalist mm. and there's tons of reflections in their mic, you can use that and it'll get rid of pretty much all of it. It wow. it is it is magical. I can't describe. Is it like a whole RX. bundle, or do you yeah, buy them one, one individual? It's, I think plug you can do them individually, time. but um, okay. I have the RX Elements bundle, so I don't have all of them, but I have enough to where I can pretty much fix anything that I need to fix. That's um, so sick. Yeah, 
Super, super useful. Must haves. Yeah. Um, what do you think are moving on? What do you think are best practices when it comes to scheduling? Are there any? Is there anything that you've learned in the last couple of months being a freelancer, um, just to not do anymore? Like, have you ever shot yourself in the foot with scheduling? Have you ever double booked? Like, oh, dude, tell me about so it. So many times. Maybe not double booking clients, but I had a tattoo appointment I overbooked on. Totally missed that. Um, I, I wouldn't take notes on something, and like the day before a session, someone would say, "Hey, are we?" Well, I guess I have double booked clients, but someone would say, "Hey, are we still good for 10 a.m. tomorrow?" And I'm like, oh, no, like last week I told Guy to be here at yeah. like noon tomorrow, you know, so I got to mm -hmm. like go and like call a bunch of people and like say, hey, can we all like all five days? Can we like move that back one day? Because I fucked up my schedule for that week. And that, that's so embarrassing, Brutal. dude. And, and, and really, the one thing I learned from that is just buy a book, like buy a notepad, use or a your scheduler phone. and you just have a write your shit down. <laughs> you, yeah, exactly. I mean. Either or, whatever works. It's I like the in. sensation of writing by hand. Sure, yeah. To each, you know, their own. Just, just, just do it either way. Yeah, just absolutely. Because it, it's gonna save you. Or use something like um, Square, right? I mean, Squarespace. Yeah. It'll take. Yeah. If you do your payments through Squarespace, they take a good chunk. So I don't know. I don't know about using that, but um, That's if you do that, thing you're you can into, you, you know? can schedule through them. There's a phone app, and it's great. It's easy. I mean, people can literally schedule online. Um, now, granted. Do people usually schedule online without talking to you? Fuck no. They talk no, to you. No. No. I mean, especially a newer client. Like when you're a smaller, you know, when you're a smaller studio guy, when you're working like us, you know, out of your house, right? Mm -hmm. Chances are you're not just gonna get like tons of randoms hitting you up. You're not you're not a, an establishment where people can walk by and see that you're a studio. In fact, I don't yep. on the front of my building, it's not advertised that it's a studio because I live in Baltimore. <laughs> I'm yeah. not trying to get fucking robbed. <laughs> um <laughs> Man, I feel that. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. But um yeah. I've never double booked either, but I definitely have, you know, accidentally booked something over a doctor's appointment on or something years ago. And yeah. I, it, it's so embarrassing. And I never I never rescheduled the client. I always said, Well, this is my fault. I have to cancel the doctor's appointment. Even if it was too late and I had to pay a cancellation fee, it's like I I personally I would have I would rather save the face and just take take the hit, whatever amount of money it was, because uh it's just so unprofessional to cancel on it people is. like that. You just don't oh, want to be yeah. that guy. It's embarrassing, man. That's just Super plain and simply it. Like Absolutely to have to have that conversation. It feels so it's awkward. Yeah. And, yeah, and it just I don't know, I saving face. That's another great way to put it too. Moving forward. I feel like I have to redeem myself and I try very hard to redeem myself after that. And after that point, I bought a calendar. I have a notepad that I write things because I want to make sure it's locked in my freaking my dome. <laughs> I have shit yeah. going on tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Don't I want to miss that. I have a whiteboard downstairs where I write right out what I have going on in the studio each week. One, so I can tell what's going on and I live with mm -hmm. somebody else so they know what's happening so they can be aware like, hey. We're doing this today. We're recording vocals. It's got to be somewhat quiet in the house, right? Just that's so kind of cool. That's cool. Yeah, just to just to let people know. Um, yeah. My roommate's my roommate's cool as fuck. He's a musician. I played in a band with him, so he he knows what's up. He's really accommodating and uh, right on. It's great yeah, yeah, to have yeah. roommates like that. Absolutely. It's rare. One of our roommates is a uh, fuck it. I'm just gonna put my personal stuff out there. One of our roommates is moving out, and we're deciding just the two of us should stay here. And you know, I'm taking hey. on more of a you know, the rent, not rent, mortgage is going to be more expensive now, um, but it'll be even nicer knowing that the house is going to be calmer, less people here. That's good oh, for totally. me and what I do. It's worth the peace of mind, certainly. Yeah, and great for what you're doing is work, too. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm sure both of you. <laughs> yeah, but anyway, that's too personal. I don't know why I brought that up. I'll tell you his name. I'll, I'll dox my friend. Um, there we go. Oh, no. <laughs> I'll tell you his social security number. Um, so, all right. Um, another good practice, um, is just making it so when the client walks in the door, there's no downtime. You can sit down and, and just fucking boom, go. Right. Yeah. So, so totally. things that I like to do for drum sessions, if I know there's going to be a drum session, I get his, the, the information about his kit right away mm -hmm. and I have everything wired in and set up already. So all we have to do is get levels and then, have, you know, set up, get levels and then we're good. I don't have to like put mics on stands, wire everything up. Oh, That's God, all taken yeah. care of. All the t all the busy work is taken care of. Same with um, any other session. I just 
the mm-hmm. client shows up, their session is already open on my computer. Yep. Everything is wired in. Yeah. Um, you want to just super get useful. straight to it. Yeah. Yeah. Any amount of downtime is just a vibe killer. And if you are paying by the hours, but if they're paying by the hour, especially, it's like, really, I'm paying to sit around for half an hour while you get shit ready. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. I feel that, dude. It feels wrong. I feel dirty when that's happening. Yeah. It's that's only happened I, a couple of times, even yeah. if it's a flat rate for the day. Yeah. I'm still like, yeah. man, like, I should have had this ready. That's one of the reasons why I tend to do flat rates nowadays. Um, you know, I break it down. I know how long shit takes, right? I've done enough of these projects that I know about how long it's going to take to do certain things. Yeah. Um, and I'll just quote them a flat rate for the project. Um, I like that because if things do take a little longer to get set up or if we decide to fuck around for 30 minutes, you know, cause we're, we're vibing and we're having fun and we're looking up a YouTube video or something, then they're not paying for that. Mm-hmm. Um, personally, that's a plus personally. I found that that works better, but granted the clients that I use it on all my clients that I have right now are I'm close with them. I've done projects with them before. So I feel like that's why that works. Maybe with newer clients, you know, it might be best to just stick with the hourly and be really professional because you yeah. don't know their skill level. You don't know if they could play their parts. You don't oh, know if yeah. they could play their parts. I've had people show up and take hours to play a basic bass track. You yep. know, and thank God I charged hourly for that project. Otherwise, I'd be losing money. Oh, God, yeah. I'm kicking yeah. myself right now, man. I'm at the like $3 an hour mark. I'm like, uh, I was 200 hours into a project. I'm really, I'm, I'm kicking myself, no doubt. Yeah, but... next time, man. Don't do that to yourself anymore. I know. Respect yourself. I know. Tables have turned. How the turntables have turned. <laughs> gotta, Respect gotta, yourself, son. That's another topic. Charging your worth. But Yeah, yeah, but but we will get into important. that. very important. You know, we'll you're always going to kick yourself looking back. It'll be a back. whole other video because because learning how to price yourself is a huge topic in, in freelancing. Um, but, okay, so yeah, being prepared. Super, super important. Um the last thing we have here, I'm sure we can think of other things, but the last thing we have here is taking notes, which kind of falls under templates, right? Like if you have mm-hmm. your compressor on your rack set up a certain way for a vocalist, you're like, ooh, that sounded really good. Take a fucking picture of the gear or the yes, guitar amp. Take a picture. That. You have a phone. You have a camera totally. in your pocket. Take a picture and document it because you're really going to be happy next time the guitarist comes in. He's like, can we get a, a tone like that again? There's no guesswork. You know what you did. You know the mics that you used. It's all documented. Yep. And most DAWs have little sections where you can take notes. So you can do, you know, written notes right in the DAW. I love put, that. You can put pictures in the DAW and Reaper as markers, I, I believe. Yep. Isn't that, know, that's just the coolest thing. Incredible. So I, 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 people should fully take advantage of that. Just, totally. Just, oh, yeah. I agree, man. It, you just, there's no chaos by doing so. It, you're not going to hurt yourself by doing it. If you hear them say, well, we want to double this part somewhere, you know, instead of like mm-hmm. wasting time from a recording session, rearranging a song that you already have halfway recorded, finish recording and then duplicate things later. Yeah. Or if you hear them talking in the back behind you, like, oh, I feel like that China should be a little more high pitched. Put a note in and say like on this, let's h- turn up that China. You know, yeah. it, it's super effective to have those things right there. Same with um, it's another part of being ready. Same with like asking. And I think we these topics kind of blend in with each other a little bit. So I'm going to just stop saying, I think we've touched on this before because there's a lot of things that we've touched on before, right? It's like one big but, topic at this point. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But, but, um, same thing with getting references from your clients. Like if they say, I want this mix to sound like this, like pay attention. Yes. You know? Take Remember some notes that. on that. Remember that. So, you know, you can deliver the product that they actually want rather than doing multiple revisions. Yep. That's just going to bite you in the ass. Revisions can be a yeah exactly they'll bite you in the ass absolutely. So your phone? What was that noise? <laughs> I thought I had my thing. Don't off, you know we're Facebook's doing a professional up. podcast right now? Fucking amateur. There we go. <laughs> hey, we're on episode three. Come on, man. <laughs> well, um, <laughs> browsing memes the whole time. <laughs> what other good practices are there, man? Because now we now we've run out of topics. Now we're kind of at the end of our rope here, and we're approaching almost 50 minutes of this, maybe a little bit longer. Yeah. So let's see if we can squeeze anything else in. Let's see if we can squeeze anything else out. Um, hmm. Well, you know, I think I'm going to say it. Um, I think we have touched on it before. 
but having an, a clean and organized environment, not only yes. something ready, but yes. instruments that maybe do have those new strings or sticks that don't have other people's finger gunk on them. Mm. Uh, cables that when they touch them to plug in their guitar, they're not dirty. You know, gen gen it's a lot of small things, but you want yeah. things to be pleasant to the, the eye, the ears and the finger. I absolutely agree. That's a fucking great observation. It's a total turn off, man. Honestly. I had I have two cats that live in the room next. Ah, this is the we've had this exact conversation. Yeah, I've have. had someone come in tell but me yeah, my place cat just reeks. Cat piss, you know, whatever it is. Make sure that yep. shit's fine. Clean. Make sure make sure your instruments are good because you never know when a client will be like, I don't have a bass. You're like, Well fuck, I got a bass. Make sure yep. it's up you and want... running. You know? Yes. At all times. That's extremely important. Functioning make equipment. Sure, make sure you have tools like a capo. Like I'm holding up yeah. right now or like a slide, you know, just, just shit, like an Ebo or something like you never know when you're going to need something or mallets for your drums. If they want softer cymbals, you never yep. know when you're going to need that. But I've had people ask for every single one of these things at some point. And if you don't have it, they're going to be fucking disappointed, man. They're going to be they really, really are. out. Yeah. Um, Even things God, like yeah. have backups of stuff too. backup yeah. sticks, backup strings. Pick, picks, guitar picks. Picks. Oh my have gosh! I yeah, have a picks. variety of picks. Speaking of picks, and and we can also work this into best practices. I think it's important to experiment with picks for different audio sources and different types of tones. Because I found um, on bass, you know, I prefer a certain type of pick when it comes to metal and rock bass. It's this little Ernie Ball. I'm not even sure exactly what it's called, but it's got this little divot here. It's purple. Hmm. I'm showing it to the camera. When I use another pick on bass, it it it's like too harsh almost with the clank but with that the clank is still there but it's like it's sitting more so the material okay. of the pick you know the thickness of the pick all of this matters and you should be experimenting with this it might Very be something true. small you haven't thought of before but like just we talked about it last time with you know the way that you fret your guitar or, or the way your fingers are interacting with the strings it's going to change how it sounds when it comes out of your pickups same thing with yes. picks Super yeah, important. Yeah, oh, almost, I feel like, more important. Well, no, they're they're both equal, but yeah. especially on a bass, those dynamics need to be pretty consistent. You don't want things mm -hmm. peaking and valleying here and there. Yep. It's yep. as smooth and even as you can get it. And, you know, same for a guitar, too. I guess it's just depending. You know, a lot of the high-gain guitars are, are pretty consistent as is. It's just a matter of accuracy. Yeah. But you have to pick hard. That's There's, yeah. a, there's, a, there's a best practice on guitar. Pick like you fucking got a pair. You, you got you to gotta yep. lay into... You got to lay into strings to get a heavier sound. Yeah. I mean, and there's a safe way to do it. You know, don't be stupid like me and fucking hurt your wrist. You know? <laughs> yeah. But there, there's a safe way to pick hard, like the angle that you there do is. pick at, kind of like which part of your forearm that you're using. Um, super important. I, it, it, this little attention to detail when it comes to guitar tone, if you don't have this, you're not going to go very far in, in this industry. Yeah. You know, your it, tracks it might, are always going to be flubby, soft yeah. sounding. Yeah. And lacking definition. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah, absolutely. Uh, super, super important. Yeah, no, that, that that was really a level up moment for me when I started actually playing my guitar. Mm -hmm. I used to tell other people when I was a total noob, like you shouldn't play your guitar so hard. And then over the years, I find myself picking the shit out of my strings yeah. with like some one millimeter thick jazz threes. So they're really going in on it, dude. Even yeah. on riffs, the, the definition, like you're saying, articulating those riffs and those punches. By the it way, it feels good. By the way, people who are real gentlemen use the Jazz 3 when it's the nylon and has the clip, has the little grip Facts. on it like this. Yeah, dude, those picks are a godsend. They're legendary. Pick. Yeah, yeah. I can't play with anything else anymore. Same. I, I hated Jazz picks when I was younger, cause, mm -hmm. but I, I just felt like too small, you know? But but now yeah. that I've, I'm good at them, it's like anytime I use a pick that's not a Jazz pick, I'm like, I have no control over this. It's so clunky. Yeah. Especially when, oh, I'm trying yeah, to string, when I'm trying to string skip. Like impossible. It does not picks. work. It's too big yeah. of a fucking thing in your fingers, dude. Yeah, Those absolutely. tiny picks are where it's at. Ooh, I have a fucking really good one that I just thought of. Backing up your data. Backing oh that gosh. shit up. If your yes. house catches on fire and you lose your computer and your entire business is gone because of that and all of your data from all of your oh. customers is gone, you are fucking up. You need to Done. have that shit backed up in at least two places. Have of it backed course. up on site on a hard drive and have it backed up on the cloud, you know, somewhere where yeah. no fire in your immediate area is going to fuck that up because hard drives can fail. Also, that's the other thing. Have it backed up on a server like Backblaze. You know, take the time to do that shit. It's not that expensive and it'll save your fucking life. I mean, it God, really can you will. imagine losing your computer is one thing, right? I mean, that's a couple grand gone if you want if you have a good computer for this, but yes. but losing your data, it's priceless. You'd have to pay 
that's if I your lost, whole business. If you lose an album that you're working on, you know, in the middle of it, what are you going to do? You either yeah. have to offer to record that entire album again for free with that band, or you have to pay them back everything. Oh they my paid goodness. You. I mean, Dude. that's insult to injury if you if your fucking house burned down and you have to pay for everything, right? It gets worse. Oh, yeah. So, oh, my God. You're absolutely right, dude. That's just a world of headache. Yeah. <laughs> There's always, no way around it. Always have shit backed up. If it is living yep. in three different places, two on-site, one off-site, then it's finally safe. That data is is backed up finally. Yes. Um, that is the smartest important. thing. That That's something yep. that should have been brought up earlier today. Yeah, that that's like the king. I feel you, like I didn't start doing that till recently because uh, I I'm upgrading my computer. Mine right now is just a POS. I'm so worried about that kind of stuff, dude. Now after you started talking about it, I got to drive at my parents' house. Nothing I had it on backed cloud up. yet, but I had it backed up here. But then my IT buddy was like, "What if your house burns down?" And I was like, "Oh, <laughs> <laughs> you're damn. You're, you're right. right dude. You're right." <laughs> <laughs> hey, because what if, man? Yeah, I, you, know, you never know. You never oh, know. Man. That's scary to think about. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, Absolutely. protect your shit. Keep your files backed up. Keep it's almost like the obvious things, you know, but it's not obvious. When someone says it, you're like, "Oh, that's pretty obvious." Like mm -hmm. cuz things like that do happen. It's not irregular. Yeah. Forest fires in the summer, floods in this area, freaking, you know. Yeah. W whatever kind of catastrophe there is, it could hit you and you yeah. would rather protect your shit and your entire business than lose it all. Absolutely. I think the last topic, which we can touch on briefly, um, is acoustic treatment. That's something mm. that matters a lot more than people care to say. I mean, right now on this camera, you can see my room looks like total shit behind me. I just have a bunch of old foam that's ripped. But in front of me, at my computer, I have acoustic panels and I have bass traps over here. And within the next two weeks, you know, I'm building rock wool panels for the room and for the live. Beautiful. Room. That's so, going to be amazing. It doesn't matter how good your gear is. If you can't listen to something properly, you're never going to be able to get a good mix. Or if you do, it's going to take a lot longer. Oh, so, yeah, dude. Super important. Over a long time, you could kind of attenuate to that. Your ear can kind of like sort nano tune of. to that. But it's not, you know, I, I've done mixes that are in really bad rooms. And I'd been in those bad rooms for like two or three years. So, I, you know, it's not great. And it took no. probably six months to get those mixes overall. And it was a lot of car referencing too much but if you can afford yeah. it you know diy some treatment that's what i have yeah. i have these panels left and right little what material did you use and then some four by twos six of them what, what material it, did you use for your panels corning 703 703 yeah i i'm gonna be using rock wool safe and sound which um that's the move go yeah, with that if you can afford they're, it they're both roughly as good as each other i think rock wool absorbs low mids and lows a bit better um that's it's more hard, important it's harder to work with your corning 703 is, is rigid so you can just wrap fabric around it and it's done. For the rock wool, I have to build, you know, wooden frames. So a little more labor intensive, but um, they look beautiful when they're done too with wooden frames. It looks, looks really nice. Looks great. And you're getting it's, a little more bang for good. your buck too. Sure, it'll sound good. Yeah. And uh, here's here's the other the other thing. Don't fucking buy acoustic panels. It's like ninety bucks for one panel. Build your own. Yeah, waste build in the bulk, money. Build in bulk. You'll spend like twenty bucks a panel. Do yep. not buy that. That is you might not be getting a brand name or you might not get one that has the little ridges on it, but dude, just don't do that. Yeah. I spent get... probably, I got three packs of six. I think it was like 380 bucks, then probably 50 bucks on fabric and then like yeah. 20 bucks on a hot glue gun and a, enough glue sticks to last me my lifetime, I'm sure. <laughs> so much cheaper. And that gets me a shit ton of panels. Yeah. I, I, I have like a thousand dollars set aside for treatment. I don't even think I'm going to use that. Honestly, the Rockwell is pretty yeah. cheap when, you, when you're buying in bulk. And you're and you're doing the panels that way with plywood. It's, oh yeah, it's fairly cheap, honestly. So and you get the thrill of the build too. Yeah, I, I love that. That's like half the fun is I put my studio together. I, yeah. I did this. Well, and once you know how to do something like that, it's easier to do it the second time. Like with building a computer, Facts. I did yep. that the first time a year and a half ago, or maybe it was, it was just, yeah about a year and a half ago. Um, daunting. But, you know, 12 hours later in one day, you know, referencing a manual, watching a couple of YouTube videos, like mm -hmm. I figured it out. I turned it on. It didn't work. I was like, oh, fuck. And I realized my graphics card wasn't seated properly. Took it out, put it back in, turned it on. Computers worked great since then. So oh, it, beautiful. If, if somebody like me who had no previous knowledge of building computers can do it, I think anybody can do it. As long as you can troubleshoot and you yeah. know, watch a YouTube video 
I, I think yeah. I think it's not that hard, frankly. I'm sure some patience, you know, 12 hours so, can be a bit frustrating it, for you some. Know, I, I, there might have been one instance where a screw on my case stripped the first time I tried to turn it, and I... I might have stomped through the house and, and fucking yelled and go, motherfucking <laughs> bullshit. Yeah, but, I mean, these things aren't cheap. No, but then I realized I didn't even have to fucking unscrew that part of the case. So I was like, oh. after like 10 minutes of being angry, I was like, oh, oh no. so stupid. <laughs> 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 this is one of those dumb moments, you know? It happens, dude. It gets the best of us every time. Oh, dude, yeah. Yeah, and then, I mean, it's not fun to install plugins and everything. Oh, I, I did something else stupid. When I installed Windows, I... I accidentally clicked the wrong button and it installed like some weird version of Windows that was used for like European office buildings and it was discontinued. So like weird. It, didn't, it didn't have like certain video plugins or certain like codec plugins. So after I installed all of my audio plugins, everything worked except for Sound Toys Effect Rack, which is all the Sound oh. Toys plugins. And I looked up all the fixes and I realized the only way to fix it was to wipe the OS and start again <laughs> oh damn <laughs> that sucks. i did that all in oh. one night I, I was like i was so that's another case of me getting up and just like walking around the house oh like, yeah dude i'd night. have done the same fucking Jesus thing Christ. i'd have been Why burned <laughs> totally but, you know, chap oh but i'm never gonna make that mistake again yeah you know? yeah exactly hey, now go. check it out you, ha you can build a computer probably twice yeah. as fast you know so, how to install these things now i guess lastly now that we're talking about computers is the best thing you can do for yourself as an engineer is get a computer that can run this shit. A, a computer, a computer that isn't going to fight you. I mean, for almost ten years, I worked on a laptop, which mm -hmm. was garbage. I mean, it was good at the time. It was like an i7, eight gigs of RAM when it came out, which was fine for the time. That was a newer processor, fast at the time. But when I started getting into like productions with live drums, I have a lot of I have instances of slight trigger running, and I have multiple. Just a lot of shit going on. I started to have to bounce tracks out and talk about a fucking workflow killer. Just oh, having dude, to sit 100%. there and wait for 40 seconds for a minute. Just fucking yeah. wait for it to be done. Your job is not fun when you have to bounce stuff out constantly. What have you noticed that a lot of times when you freeze or render stuff, like it sounds different? And if you look if you look at the original wave file versus the the frozen one, sometimes it'll like nudge it a couple samples over and you're like, fuck. No it's kidding. Fuck. I've never yeah. paid attention to that. Ooh boy, I have. I've um, obviously I've noticed a difference. I, I guess like a yeah. sound difference, but not necessarily a placement difference. Yeah, I think that's why it actually sounds different. Is it's fucking with with that? You know um, what I have noticed though. I'll I'll print something because my computer. I, I'm in your past situation. Crappy laptop. I've had yes. it for like six, seven, eight years. I don't know anymore. Too long. Mm -hmm. Um, I'll print a stem. You know, and my computer's already working really hard, and that stem will be full of glitches. So I'll have to turn off plugins signal chains before i start printing and then turn those chains on and off as i go down that is a my huge list of pain in the ass takes up forever a total buzz kill oh man but hey you bought the computer parts and you're about to build it so congrats man you did it right on dude you fucking Thank did you, man. it Thanks i for encourage the everyone to do it that. <laughs> everyone should do it take two grand you can make two grand you know work at your fucking day job you know eat yep. shit for a couple weeks save two grand I, 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 a lot of people who get into this are you get into it when you're a teenager right and course, when i was yeah. a teenager i lived with my parents that was that's the best time to save money is when you're still yes. living with your parents oh my gosh yeah you know, just just save everything you can because you're gonna need it a lot of the yeah. money that i saved up back then i still have in my bank account <laughs> you know it's, that's amazing it's, it's important it's just fucking say you'll thank yourself later you know yeah you yeah know, pick, you pick up the extra shift at work you know you'll fucking hate your life then but then years down the line, you'll be able to confidently go full time because you're like, I got, I got a ton of money right now. If this month is slow, I'll be okay. That is if a I need very to, good feeling. If I need to buy a new car, so be it. That's okay. Yep. You know, just, just life stuff that happens. So, all right, I think we're gonna end the episode here. We're kind of cool, getting cool. off topic, and that was a, we, that was a great. That was a lot. Been going for about an hour. Or so anyway. Thank you guys so much for watching. If you made it all the way to the yeah. end, please subscribe. We don't have a lot of subscribers. Yeah, you're awesome. We need we need subscribers just so yeah. we know that you guys like this. We want you to see message it. us too. Let, um, let's be friends. If you made it this far, let's be friends. Yeah, message me. Let's we're talk. We're still planning <laughs> on doing this every week, Mondays at two p.m. Um, and maybe in the next couple of episodes, we might have a guest come on. We have a couple people, you know, local producers talking about, you know, I, hey, we'd like to come on. So um, we'll keep you guys updated. But uh, totally. anyway, for now, 
Thank you guys for tuning in. Have a nice Thank night. Thank you very much. Have a good one.